We're really doing well everywhere. And then people don't know. We go to Nevada. We just had a poll out. We're at 89 percent, Madam Attorney, to 89 percent in Nevada. Then we go to uh, Nikki Haley's state, South Carolina, where the governor endorsed me. We're Lindsay and everybody. I mean, we're just about everybody's endorsed me almost. And we're uh, leading her by 40 points or 50 points, which is pretty tough to do. And and then we come down and we eventually get to Florida. We love Florida. We're leading one on one with Ron. I'm at 89 and he's at 11. That's a big difference. And we started, I was slightly ahead in all fairness. You know, I got, people don't know, in Florida, I got uh, more votes by one and a half million than he did. They talk about his great victory. But he only had that victory because of me. But I got one and a half million more votes than him in Florida. But they did a poll and uh, he's not even a factor. So he's really hurt himself because I think he would have, if he were a loyal person, if he would have waited four years, he's young, he's a young guy, he would have, I don't say anybody walks in because you still have to show some semblance of personality, you have to do some things right, and so it's never a walk-in, but let's assume he would have gotten my endorsement and he would have been loyal and everything else, but I think the lack of loyalty, a lot of people said when I went after these two people and a couple of others, sir, very you know, highly paid professionals in the back. They said, sir, people don't care about loyalty in politics. I said, I think they do. And when I explained, like, when I explained about loyalty, like, as an example, uh, excuse me, with your governor, I gave her, think of it, first in the nation, I gave her ethanol, I gave her everything. But she was lieutenant governor, just like Henry McMaster, and I took Terry Brand set out, and I made him ambassador to China, and she became, because of me, she became governor. Hey, Typically, when that happens, when you're appointed governor or senator, you don't do well in the next election. Very rarely do you win. I don't know if you have a, when you get appointed, you very rarely win. She was losing by 10 points, and she called me, would I do a rally for her? I ended up doing two rallies and giving her a very big endorsement, and she ended up beating a very rich, I don't know who this guy is, all they said is he's a rich, very good-looking farmer. Well, those are good credentials for Iowa, right? Rich, good-looking farmer. And he was going to win. And I came in and I saved her. But then I gave her, First in the Nation gave her everything. Really good. And I figured, you know, again, I don't do quid pro quo. But when I came in and I announced, I said, by the way, are you going to be endorsing me? Sir, I'd rather remain neutral. I said, wow. You're going to remain neutral? Wait a minute, I gave you the position. Not that one thing has to do with the other, but I gave you that position. Yes, sir, I'd rather remain neutral because I have to protect first in the nation. But I gave you first in the nation. Then she said, then she said, well, you have to understand, I'm the governor, and I want to be able to travel with each and every candidate that's running against you, and you too, sir, and I want to campaign with you. I said, you mean you'd campaign with other candidates? Yes, sir. I said, uh, I don't want to ever see you on my campaign again. And that was it. And that was it. So I don't blame her for then picking somebody because we wouldn't let her go to any rallies or anything. But here's the thing I'm most proud of. She went from the most popular governor in the United States in two weeks to the least popular governor. She's the least popular governor in the United States. But I just thought it was very disloyal. You know, I mean, I just don't understand it. I don't understand it. And that happens in politics. What? What is? Oh, thank you very much. That's, that's so cute. Nikki and Crooked Joe are both backed by warmongers and left-wing globalist Wall Street millionaires and billionaires who crave to destroy the MAGA movement. People are not happy with MAGA because MAGA's taking over. MAGA's, you know, when they, you, you hear the fake news when they say, well, MAGA represents, MAGA represents 44% of the Republican, no, no, MAGA represents 95% of the Republican Party. Whenever you hear this stuff, and uh, they, it's an amazing thing. When Joe Biden gets up and he's so angry, we're going to fight MAGA. And I say, what does MAGA mean? He has no idea. You know what it means, Joe? It means make America great again, right? It's a simple, simple thing. No harm intended. Uh, probably the greatest phrase in the history of politics, right, MAGA? 
I almost changed it to CAG, Keep America Great, right? But it didn't seem to have the magic. Either. You can, you just can't, there'll never be anything like MAGA, make America great again. And then after he ran the country, I couldn't use CAG because America right now is not a great country. We're laughed at all over the world. Unlike Nikki, uh, I'm working for you. And, uh, you know, I'm working for you. And she's working for a lot of other people, people that don't necessarily love our country so much. She's, you're not going to find, you're going to find out a lot about her in the next short period of time. But she's starting to fade, as people find out. And she's got some really bad money behind her. She's got Democrats financing her in New Hampshire. She's got Koch, who's a globalist, total globalist. Uh, he's fighting her. He's, uh, it's funny. He said he had the best years he's ever had under the Trump administration. He actually made a statement. Charles Koch, David was a friend of mine. Charles, I don't really know Charles Koch. I saw him interview, he had a broken leg and he had Bermuda shorts on. I said, if I had a broken leg, I wouldn't be wearing Bermuda shorts during an interview. I thought it was the worst interview I've ever seen. Under the Trump administration, you were better off, your family was better off, your neighbors were better off, your communities were better off, and our country was better off. We were never stronger than we were just three years ago, energy independent. America was stronger, richer, and safer, and more confident than ever before when I sat behind the Oval Desk, that beautiful Oval Office with the Resolute Desk. Do you ever hear of the Resolute Desk? The most, you know, when you become president, they give you a choice of seven different desks. They're all beautiful. But the Resolute is the Resolute. It's the beauty. Ronald Reagan, a lot of great, a lot of great people, a lot of great presidents, a lot of great presidents. Resolute. As president, I gave you the largest tax cuts in history and virtually eliminated the estate tax to protect your family farms. I don't know if you know that. If you love your children, I always say this, if you love your children, you have to vote for Trump. If you don't love your children, then that doesn't mean what I just said, because you shouldn't leave it to them. If you don't love your children, and if you don't, then don't give it to them. Does anybody in this room not love their children? Who? Who? I know you love your children. You love your children. Uh, not too many hands. I, I've never seen a hand go up. Then everybody has to vote for me because I gave you tax cuts. You know what was happening is uh, you'd leave the farm to the kids. The, the government comes along, they assess it. They put a value on it. You have to go out and borrow large amounts of money. And typically within three or four years, you end up losing the farm because it's not such a cash business, but it's a great value business. Valuable, beautiful farm and what it stands for. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful life. But you'd leave it and they'd lose it. And they'd lose it in foreclosures to the banks. And we took that out. You no longer have a state tax to pay on your farms and small businesses. So I think it's great. I think it was very good. So now we have to defend our tax cuts from Joe Biden, who wants to pass the largest tax hike in American history. He wants to terminate the tax cuts given to me by you. That includes the estate tax, or as we call it, the death tax. I will make the Trump tax cuts permanent and cut taxes for families and farmers even more. We have a substantial uh, hit coming, positive hit coming. We're going to reduce them even further. Now, I have to tell you that when I did the tax cuts, they were the largest ever in the history of our country, bigger than Reagan's tax cuts years before. He, he did the biggest up until that time. We topped it. And everyone said, oh, well, the income, we're not going to have the income. We ended up taking in almost 100% more income, and we created the strongest economy in history. So with smaller taxes, people were doing much more business, and we were actually taking into the Treasury more money. It's an amazing stat, you know, so people have to know it. But starting on my first day back to the Oval Office, I will end Joe Biden's inflation nightmare, rescue our economy, and we will do one thing that's going to work very quickly and fast, drill, baby, drill. We're going to drill, baby, drill. And also on day one, I will seal the border and I will shut down the invasion of our country. It's an invasion. This isn't a normal situation. This is an invasion. Thank you. Three years ago, we had the most secure border in U.S. history, by far. We built 561 miles of border wall. You know, if there's a little piece, if there's a nail from a wall that was there 75 years ago, a little bit of a nail left from the rust, 
or if there's a two by four that's rotted out laying on the ground someplace, they say, that's not a border wall. That's that's a renovation. No, it's not a renovation. It was uh, you'd see little areas where you'd have some dead wood rotting on the ground for 40 years. We built over 500 miles, much more than I said I was going to do. And then we had an additional 200 miles that we were getting ready to put up. We could have done it in three weeks. He could have done it. And they decided not to do it. And it was a terrible thing because our border is a mess. But they actually wanted open borders. That was the amazing thing. But we got Mexico to give us 28,000 soldiers free of charge. You know, when we talk about I said, I'm going to charge Mexico for the wall. This is much more expensive when I there was no legal mechanism that Mexico could give us money to build a wall for us. But there was legal precedent for them giving us soldiers. And I went to the president and I said, you're going to have to give us a lot of soldiers. Why? Because they're coming through your country and they're hurting us very badly. No, I won't do that. I won't. And I liked him a lot. He said, but would you speak to my representative? So they came to Washington, a delegation. They saw me. The State Department was heading it. And a woman, very good woman, but a lousy negotiator, to be honest with you, a very quality woman. She loved Mexico. She worked on Mexico for 25 years. She said, sir, they will never give you that. We've been trying to get that for 25 years. I said, oh, I'll get it, 100 percent. I said, what else do you want? And we got uh, Tom Homan involved, who's great, you know, central casting. I think he's central casting. He was great. And we got uh, our, our Border Patrol people, Brandon Judd and all of these people. These are incredible people. They actually want to do their job. They could have they have a much easier job by not doing their job, but they want to do it. And I said, give me a list of the top 10 things and Title 42, everything. They gave me a list that one of the things is remain in Mexico. You have to remain in Mexico. You can't come into our country. So I had a list of 10 things, uh, catch and release in Mexico. We called it catch and release in brackets, in Mexico. We have catch and release in our country that nobody would ever leave. So they gave me these things, and this very handsome man shows up representing the president of Mexico. And he said, the chief top guy, and he said, uh, sir, uh, you've asked for some things that, of course, are ridiculous. Of course, we, yes, you'll give them to us. 100% you'll give them to us. No, no, we will not. I said, uh, first thing we need, we need 28,000 soldiers free of charge. No. He goes, why would we do that? We're not going to give you 28,000. <laughs> Sir, this is ridiculous. I said, no, 100 percent you're going to give them to us, 100 percent. I have no doubt. Then I want to have a remain in Mexico policy where people can't come into our country. They have to stay in your country until we vet them. And uh, he said, no, we won't do that. We've never done that. We won't do that. Yes, you will. 100 percent. I'm telling you, 100 percent. And he started getting confused. You know, he's saying, like, then uh, we did the problem where very sick people are coming into our country. So we had, as you know, we have a very specific bill that was passed years ago to keep people that are sick. We don't want to catch disease from people that sadly are not feeling so great. And various other things that were just as bad. And I had 10 of them. I said to the Border Patrol, I said to Brandon Judd, give me a top 10, a top 10 list. And he gave me a top 10. And he smiled. He said, you know, They've been after this for years. They, have, they haven't been able to get one half of one. So because, you know, every country out, out negotiates us because we have stupid people running our country for the most part. When you look at what China did, I took in hundreds of billions of dollars. Nobody before me, nobody took in 10 cents from China. So I said, no, no, this is uh, what I want. And he tells me, and I said, here's the story, sir. I'm signing before me a bill, and if you don't have this approved within before the end of this meeting where we get 28,000 soldiers free of charge and all of the other things stay in Mexico. We called it remain in Mexico. Remain in, isn't that a nice title? Remain in Mexico. Sounds simple, but it's very complex for them, not for us. I said, then I'm going to sign this. And this says that we are going to put on Mexico a 25% tax or tariff on every car, you know, they sold 32% of our car industry. I don't know if you know that, Jim. 32% of our car industry has been taken out of the United States. It's made in Mexico. They have factories that you wouldn't believe. They go miles long, bigger factories than what we have. They stole it over the years. Not with me. I stopped it. I was going to put a charge of if they make a car in Mexico, sell it in the United States, I was going to put a 30% tariff on it. And they decided not to build those particular factories. But nobody else does that stuff. So I said, here's the story. You're going to either do it or I'm going to put a 25% tax on every single product coming into the United States from Mexico. 
And that'll be far more money than the money that we're talking about. And he says, sir, may I uh, make a phone call, please? <laughs> He's, you know, do you know the sign of a choker? It's when they start grabbing their neck because they can't breathe. Dan Gable never choked. He doesn't know what I'm talking about because he didn't choke. That guy was a winner. He's only like 150, I think 150 and one. I don't know. I think he had, he had COVID for the one or something. I don't know what the hell happened. But the greatest guy, even Jim Jordan, who was an All-American, three-time all he said, nope, Dan was the greatest of them all. Do you still say that? That's pretty good, Dan. I mean, it's not, it's not chopped liver here, right? But anyway, so I said, I said, uh, all right, come on, you have five minutes, just call up the president. And he walks back, sir, uh, on behalf of the president of Mexico, it would be my great honor to give you 28,000 soldiers free of charge, give you Remain in Mexico, give you catch and release in Mexico. The guy's going like, ha, oh. And uh, we got it all. And we had the safest border in the history of our country. And it was pretty amazing, and it was pretty easy. <laughs> Under Biden, the USA has become a dumping ground to the world. And speaking of Mexico, you know, Biden's people went to see them two days ago. Mexico said, we want $5 billion just to talk. I said, what? They want $5 billion to talk. And you know what our guy said? We'll consider it. These are the worst, these are the, these are the worst people. And it's not even like bad, I, I, they're stupid people, okay? They're stupid, they're stupid. In New York City last week, American school children were kicked out of class so that the school could be turned into a migrant camp. And think of this, a migrant camp. Biden puts America last, I put America first, our border is so important, so important. <laughs> Now, I do something, so, and because it's sad, we don't have a lot to do, okay? But boy, we're gonna have a lot to do tomorrow. And you have a lot to do today to talk to your friends, right? Tomorrow's the big day, but we have a little time. Does anybody wanna hear the snake? You want it, takes it out, okay. Because I think it's so appropriate. Jim Jordan's never heard this before, I don't think. But it's so appropriate, and uh, it has to do with People coming into your country, it has to do with who they are. You know what you're getting. We know what we're getting. We're getting terrorists. We're getting jailbirds. We're getting guys that were major, major drug lords coming into our country, staying here. And uh, they're not going to be school teachers. They're not going to be innocent people. They're going to cause tremendous harm and death. And so this is called the snake. And this was an old rock and roll song, but, you know, mended somewhat. To be honest, probably every word is amended, almost, by me. But I think it's very uh, instructive, and I think it's very important, actually. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor, half-frozen snake. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Poor thing, she cried, I'll take you in and I'll take care of you. Take me in, O oh, tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. She wrapped him up all cozy in a comforter of silk and laid him by her fireside with some honey and some milk. She hurried home from work that night, and soon as she arrived, she found the pretty snake she'd taken in had been revived. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, cried the vicious snake. She clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in by now, you truly would have died. She stroked his pretty skin again and kissed and held him tight. But instead of saying, thank you, ma'am, the snake gave her a vicious bite. Take me in, O oh, tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. I saved you, cried the woman, and you've bitten me, but why? You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. The snake, that's our border. 
We're taking in people from prisons. We're taking in people from mental institutions. We're taking in murderers and drug lords. We're taking in people that are very, very sick with diseases that will be spread all over our nation. We're doing the wrong thing for our country. It's going to be very hard to recover from that, but we're going to start on day one with deportation. Okay? Does that make sense, by the way? Does that make right? Is there anyone in the room that doesn't get it? Because if you don't, please leave. We don't. You're, you're hopeless if you don't get it. That's what's happening to our country. That's what's at the snake. Just remember it. As soon as I take the oath of office, I'll terminate every open border policy of the Biden administration and begin the largest deportation operation in American history. And, you know, it's not a nice thing to say. It's a tough thing to say. But remember, Dwight Eisenhower, if you actually know, he's a pretty good president. And uh, when he was president, he was very much into exactly that. They had a big border problem. And he'd take people, and they'd just drop them on the other side of the border. But they'd drop back. And then he realized that you had to take them away. And they'd fly them 3,000 miles down into deep South America. And uh, generally, they would never come back. But he was very tough on deportations and we're going to have to because what's happening to our country is not sustainable it's not sustainable we can't have 15 16 18 million people i mean they're taking over our schools they're taking over our hospitals you go to a hospital and you can't and and you know you want to take care of people they're people whether they're american people but it's not sustainable it's no good it's not sustainable our people are suffering greatly in manhattan you have thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of people poured into New York, and they're living on Madison Avenue. They're staying on Fifth Avenue. They're p p nobody's ever seen anything like it. And in all due respect to the mayor of New York, he's really he's fighting it as much as he's going to fight it. He's fighting a, a criminal element, a sick element. He's fighting an element of people that have no idea what they're doing to our country. Or they do have an idea, and that's even worse, because if they did, they would know that they're destroying our country.